I wasn't sure you'd wake up. I hoped you would. I wanted to show you something beautiful. Everyone is Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Reality is made of language, and we're like co creating it with tonight's our entertainment. The thoughts become reality. Tell me, I only have one question. do you enjoy music? I suppose. You see, I'm a musician of sorts, and on my way to give a very special performance. Tonight, I intend to call upon the entire orchestra for this particular event, and would be most honored if you could join me. I promise you it'll be like nothing you've ever After the It's been said that philosophy can be divided into three branches. There's ontology, which tells us what there is in the world, what exists. What is this? There's epistemology, is which, tell, this? which helps us to understand how we know about that which exists out there. Well, thank God, no. And Whatever. there's ethics. You are. Now that we know what there is and how we know about it, what do we do about it? Right? Tomato, um, tomato. <clears throat> In the topic that I turn to now with the examination of the heroic career, we're turning, I think, to the question of what do we do about it now that we find ourselves in this cosmic? The question fundamentally of how to live. Now you may see this as a limited case. After all, not everyone sets out to be a hero. I think that's probably wrong. Insofar as heroism is a culture's way of establishing what it is to live a successful life. What is the most successful or the most honorable life? The mode of life that will serve as guarantor that one's life was in fact worthwhile. An age of freedom. I all the powers of observation continue to serve you. Let's start by learning a little about the overture. What is he talking about? Now, if that notion is true, this is what you want me to do. Then the question of who we permit to strive for heroism. Like a barrier, need a little patience. For example, all right. Hey. Is a woman a candidate? What's so? Funny? Are peacemakers candidates? And what that striving consists in are not specialized or peripheral questions. But in fact, they are central to the definition of a self in a society. I think a lot about the purity of that. Boom, the end. Start again. The world made clean for the new man to rebuild. Uh, another mode in which this has I this question. The world would have looked to the sky. Of feminine and masculine socialization, and in fact, mythological versions of the self, has seen that the paradigmatic masculine myth might often be seen as Icarus, the falling star, spectacular in aspiration and also in extinction. Whereas, on the other hand, one might see the myth of Demeter and Persephone as the classic, the paradigmatic myth of female experience. Uh, Persephone, of course, being the lost daughter, the, hell are you doing? The, water, the daughter who dies in part, what are you doing here? but also carries you. on in part, you very much. whose fundamental story is not one about a spectacular spending of the self, but rather one about carrying on and about relation to others, to in particular in that myth, to her mother, uh, to her husband, who is, interestingly enough, death, but we won't go And a word, college! Anyway... <laughs> what Todorov outlines, then, as an alternative to the kind of heroism that I've been discussing in the Greek literary texts and uh, the Greek the code, code I'm your partner. is the courage to live rather than the will to die. Okay? Finally, in many circumstances, it seems to me that may be a harder choice mm -hmm. and one that our culture needs to reevaluate today. The stoic wise man huh? is a man who has trained his soul, trained his mind, so that he is not afraid of apparent evils. He is only afraid of real evil. He is afraid of losing control of his soul. He is afraid of being a slave to lust, to desire, to emotion. The stoic man is the honorable philosopher, the man who stands at his duty and is steadfast and serious-minded. We started the fight. 
In living according to nature, what the Stoic philosopher does is examine the nature of the human condition and the nature of the world around us. He discerns his position in nature, he discerns the kind of creature that he is, and he lives in such a way as not to disgrace himself, as not to be less than what he truly could be. He won't live the swinish life that we found with Aristophanes. He wants to be, if not a god, certainly not less than human. He won't be an animal either. He will live up to the fullest potential that a human being has to offer. Now, among the Roman Stoics, two are especially noteworthy. One is Epictetus, and one is Marcus Aurelius. And one of the wonderful ironies about the history of philosophy is that Epictetus was a slave and Marcus Aurelius was a, an emperor. And philosophy is the great equalizer. Both the slave and the emperor can equally well participate in a philosophy that is accessible to all human beings as human beings. There is nothing less conscious of social status than philosophy. A wise man, a man who is disciplined in control of his motions and follows the way of nature, can be a good man no matter what his position in the social structure is. He is not responsible for the social structure and it is not his problem. Your job is not to disgrace yourself and live up to the highest potentials of human being. The most interesting of the Stoics is Marcus Aurelius. Lord Acton, the great English philosopher and historian, once said that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's generally speaking true. The difficulty with that generalization is Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was an absolute ruler. He was a ruler of the Roman Empire. Now, for almost all the Roman emperors, they lived scandalous lives and they disgraced themselves. They were much more concerned with indulging their sensual appetites, and satisfying their passions, flying into rages. Marcus Aurelius is the standing exception to that, and the exception to Lord Acton's generalization. In his case, Power didn't corrupt. Absolute power did not corrupt absolutely. Instead, absolute power allowed us to see what the man underneath the body is really like. It allowed us to find out what Marcus Aurelius' soul is like. Imagine a man for whom all the restraints of law and custom and political order are taken away. He can have whatever he wants. If a man under those circumstances behaves well, you know something about the soul underneath because no external constraint is making him do what he is doing. And Marcus Aurelius is the one example of an absolute ruler who behaves himself in such a way as not to disgrace himself. It's an amazing temptation. Imagine what it's like. Stop and put yourself in that place for a second. Imagine anything that the bronze... No, I can't say that I do. ...desiring... I don't know how to... But emotional, I'm kind of a big deal. irrational parts of your soul's want. And now imagine that you can have it. Really? Now, under those circumstances, imagine People that you are forced me. to bear with this human condition for 19 long years. I'm very happy for you. Now, ask yourself, you stop and think about it for a minute. How many of you would fail to disgrace yourselves? Marcus Aurelius serves as a standing uh, reproach to our self-indulgence, a standing reproach to the idea that we are unable to deal with the circumstances of human life. If you can deal with temptation at that level, I cannot imagine what is outside the human potential. And for the Stoics, we must remember that any virtue which is accessible to any human being is in principle accessible to all of us. We all have a rational nature which allows us to control our, our feelings, our control our behavior, Ballet control our feelings. connection to other people. Compared to Marcus Aurelius, we have tiny little temptations. A man who does what he ought to do regardless of circumstance. Tough Roman virtue. He's not afraid of being dead. He's not afraid of being in pain. He's not afraid of having people laugh at him. He's only afraid of doing what's wrong. He's only afraid of making chaos of his soul. Why? Because his soul is the only thing he's completely in control of. It's the only thing he's responsible for, and the rest of it is a matter of indifference to him. He'll certainly try and perform his function as emperor in the best way he possibly can. If, for some reason, he gets sick, well, sickness is part of human life. You accept it as it is, you deal with it the best you can, and then you move on. In other words, Marcus Aurelius intends to live a life in which he will not have to feel guilty about anything. He wrote a book called The Meditations, and it's a book to himself that's not intended to be published. What if a man writes a book to himself? Well, what sense does that make? Think about it. The nature of a book is communicating something, and we would think we would communicate it to some reader. But this is not going to be published. It's written to himself. 
What makes a man write a book to himself? And there's a very deep answer, I think, here. Marcus Aurelius writes a book to himself because he's the loneliest man in the world. He has no friends because he has no equals. Think about a man breaking himself on the rock of an impossible virtue. He has no equals. Everyone he talks to wants something from him. He is the emperor of everything in the world. He owns it all. Everything he says immediately gets done. He has absolute life and death power over everyone. So anytime he's in the throne room, he's having an audience. Someone comes in from some part of the empire. They're always here for some reason, and they're always here because they want something from him. And all Marcus wants to do is live a philosophical life. But he happens to have had the misfortune to be born the emperor of Rome. What a pity. So he has to deal with these self-centered, swinish people all the time. And it is his responsibility to do good for them, to give them justice, to give them both examples of virtue and virtuous laws and virtuous decisions. And the weariness of it gets to him after a while. The book that he's written, The Meditations, is shot through with a kind of philosophical melancholy that is extremely moving despite the stoic content of what he's saying. In other words, oddly enough, there are very few books in the world which generate more pathos, which create more of a sense of pity for a person reading this than this book. He's writing a book to himself because he has no one else to talk to. And what kind of things does he write in the book? Moral maxims. And he has two or three ideas. So about a hundred odd pages. But he says essentially the same thing again and again and again. Why? He has nobody to talk to. So that limits the scope of his conversations. And he's constantly trying to re remind himself that, look, although the people you're dealing with are corrupt, evil, and depraved, it's your job not to get angry with them, but to try and teach them and morally improve them. If you can't morally improve them, at least put up with them. Because the gods have created us social animals. And it is part of the mark or it is the mark of a philosophical man that he should return benefits for harm because those that would harm other people do not live the philosophical life. Those that don't want the ultimate good for themselves and for society do so because they don't know any better. It's way too simple for these jokes. Marcus has not only political power, but wisdom. And in that respect, he's the only example in the Western tradition of any ruler who even remotely approximates Plato's philosopher king. And he has some of the qualities that Plato thought the philosopher king would have. He is totally disdainful of wealth. Why he owns everything. What would it be like to own everything from England to Egypt? Well, the idea of accumulating more stuff becomes less and less interesting. If you stop and think about it. And if you can have sex with, say, a million people, the million at first has very limited attraction. And at that point, he stops to think and he says, I will do my best to constantly do what I ought to do. And there is a sort of whistling in the graveyard tone to this book. He is in some respects an enormously lonely man, and in some respects an enormously sad man. There's a melancholy in this that's terrifically moving. And yet, we ought not to pity Marcus Aurelius, because if you looked at our lives, he would pity us. Pathetic creatures that we are, we don't even meet his standard of virtue, and we're pitying him. Think about the irony of that. He said, well, I'd pity you back if I didn't think that was disrespectful. In the book itself, he has moral maxims. He says things like this. Soon you will have forgotten all things, and soon all things will have forgotten you. In other words, don't get overwrought. You're angry with this guy just because he didn't do what he was supposed to do? Ask yourself how many of the people that are working for you are doing what they're supposed to do. Soon, you'll have forgotten all this, because you'll be dead. Is it just me? And soon, all the people who know you, they're going to be dead too, and they'll have forgotten you. Is it getting crazy out there? So what's the point of being mean to people? Now imagine the kind of philosophical self-restraint we're talking about here. This is a guy who can chop everyone's head off if he gets sufficiently angry, so he never does. Remarkable. So Marcus Aurelius is a man who constantly, in his book, is writing short one and two line epigrams that essentially say things like, don't lose your temper with these people, Marcus, you know how they are. Marcus, it's not your fault that they're stupid. You tried to teach them, and you can keep on trying to teach them. But if Socrates is a good man and they killed him, what do you expect them to do to you? <laughs> this was written 2,000 years ago by Marcus Aurelius. Accept whatever comes to you woven in the pattern of your destiny, for what could more aptly fit your needs? <laughs>